Um, so Marcia, the summit is addressing topics that cross multiple disciplines and sectors. Why are these sorts of conversations and connections essential for tackling climate change? So uh, many of you know that I'm a geoscientist. And so geoscientists tend to take the long view on this. And one thing uh, that I've seen, and I'm sure many of you have, is um, the history of the planet's exit from the last ice age. And uh, climate was changing, sea level was rising, and then suddenly it stabilized. And right when it stabilized, that's when civilization began. Nomadic tribes put down their roots on a stable shoreline. They had a stable climate to develop agriculture and animal husbandry. They um, developed commerce. They um, uh, developed science and engineering. And in the space of but 2% of human history, the population of humans on this planet grew by almost four orders of magnitude. But now we are entering a stage where that stable climate that allowed all of that to happen is changing. And it's going to be changing faster than it ever has in human history. And so the reason we need to take this all of science, all of engineering, all of medicine approach is we have to understand what that change is going to mean to humans continuing to be able to thrive on this planet? How will it affect disease burden? How will it affect land and ocean productivity? How will it affect human migration and wars? How will it impact the um, uh, extreme weather events we've been seeing? How will it impact um, our ability or the planet's ability to provide the clean air and water through ecosystem services that we depend? We don't know exactly the answers to those questions, and, but we have to find strategies to adapt and mitigate the worst consequences. National Academies is a great place to have these conversations because we include sciences, all of the sciences, including social sciences, engineering, and medicine, and these are the kinds of conversations we need. Thank you for setting that out so clearly, Marcia, appreciate it. So there's a main stage session at this summit, a little later today, on the role of higher education. Mm -hmm. How might universities need to evolve to meet the challenges of climate change? And how are the national academies thinking about catalyzing this stage? Yeah, so um, universities are an institution, one of the institutions that's most important in the development of young minds and young attitudes. It's often the first place where young people uh, live after they leave their parents' homes. And so universities, first of all, need to model the very best behavior in terms of this looming climate crisis. They need to show these students through their own actions how they are mitigating and adapting to the climate future. The second thing that universities need to do is they need to use all the tools in their arsenal to uh, develop solutions to the coming climate crisis. And universities are not only the institutions that shape young people, but they are also the repositories of the most brilliant minds in the country who can address this. And then um, a third thing that I think it's important for universities to do is they can develop extension programs which reach out into their local communities and help local industry and local citizens um, understand what is going to be happening to them personally and what they can do to minimize the impacts. Because the universities not only hold the trust of the local people, but they also know exactly what problems they are up against. I think the National Academies can help in all of this by first of all, encouraging pilot projects, by assessing the impacts of these policies, and by creating action collaboratives where leaders in the university community come together, share experiences, and disseminate best practices. Thank you, as a Boston University dean, I appreciate that call to action for universities, thank you. 
Um, so, other one for you. A lot of people traveled to this conference, uh, generating greenhouse gases to do so. As a leader, how do you weigh such trade-offs between managing the National Academy's own climate footprint and supporting the programs that are essential to its core mission? Right, so during the pandemic, the National Academy's carbon footprint basically plummeted to just about zero. No one was traveling to meetings here. Staff weren't even commuting into work. Everyone was uh, dispersed. And I naively hoped that after the pandemic ended, we would um, try to retain most of that carbon footprint reduction. But sadly, we learned through the pandemic that Zoom is not a platform to engender trust. And we saw, first of all, trust with the public, science, the trust in scientists and engineers and medical professionals fell during the pandemic. But what we noticed even more acutely here was the ability of one scientist to listen with an open mind to the views of another scientist with whom they didn't agree was not happening when they were not face-to-face, -face, having lunch together, sharing uh, a glass of wine after the meeting. And so it actually jeopardized the entire mission of the academy when we couldn't build trust and reach consensus. So um, although our carbon footprint has ramped up, this meeting is one example, we are still trying to look with a very critical eye as to what travel is absolutely necessary. There are many routine functions uh, of people who already work together that don't necessarily, they've already built trust. They don't need to have every meeting in person. We are also going to try to be using standing committees more for our work. Committees that have already gelled, they already have respect, they already understand each other's viewpoints to do more of our work. Um, so I, I think that we're going to try to find some way to uh, not go back to the bad old days, but still get our mission done because frankly, it's not gonna do the planet any good for all the scientists and engineers to retreat to their corners and not come up with acceptable solutions for society. That's not uh, a good solution either. Yeah, I appreciate that call for moving um, toward listening and building trust because, you know, as the saying goes, change moves at the speed of trust. Yes. Right. So I have one, one more for you. Mm -hmm. How do you see the National Academy's leadership on climate change evolving over the next 10 years? Mm -hmm. What type of expertise and resources do decision makers need access to? And how can the Academy satisfy that need? Yeah. So as um, Greg Sims already mentioned in his opening remarks, the National Academy was really out in front in raising the alarm bells for climate change. The Charney report that he mentioned um, was written 45 years ago, and its predictions are still ringing true today of what the temperature increase would be from doubling of CO2. And in fact, if anything, they might have been almost too conservative. Uh, but so we went from, um, first of all, just saying, look, climate change is gonna happen and we're causing it and it's gonna happen really quickly, to then going to trying to understand the impacts of climate change across all sectors of society and uh, for the natural systems upon which we depend. So we literally issued 2,000 or more um, consensus reports, workshop documents, other sorts of uh, items, um, public um, education documents, uh, to try to understand what climate change means uh, for us and for our planet. And then we entered a third phase where we went beyond just trying to understand the future to starting to assess different approaches to mitigating climate change. Um, of course, we always felt from the beginning that reducing um, our greenhouse gas uh, emissions was the number one thing. But you know, you go outside today and you know that we've already passed a point where simply mitigating our emissions is not gonna stop the coming future. 
And so we also have been assessing options such as carbon capture and um, geoengineering techniques, which are, of course, uh, far more controversial, um, but unfortunately also far cheaper. I think we're going to be entering a next phase now in which we're actually going to be um, needing to create specific roadmaps for addressing the climate crisis uh, here at the Academy, how science and engineering and medicine can help us um, continue to have humans thrive on this planet. Thank you, um, Marsha, so much. I hope everybody will join me in thanking Marsha for a really fascinating set of insights.